It's time to get evil, baby, because this is going to be my attempt at doing a hardcore Nuzlocke in Pokemon Ultra Sun with only Dark types. But not just any boring old Dark types, shiny Dark types. That's right, I hate my free time, so I will be shiny hunting for every single encounter in this run. You should know that I have bumped up the shiny odds a bit because I want to finish this run before Pokemon Z is inevitably announced. Don't worry about me though, I promise I have a great work-life balance. In parentheses, say that part sarcastically. Oh f I wasn't supposed to read that part of the script, was I? For the uninitiated, hello, my name is Vivid, and at this point, it is my goal to do a shiny-only hardcore Nuzlocke for every type in the game. And this is my sixth one, so we're making progress. If you enjoy these videos, please consider leaving a like, and also subscribe to the channel if you're not already. My goal was to hit 50k by my birthday on July 31st, but that doesn't seem super doable since that is either today or tomorrow depending on when this video is uploaded. So let's just shoot for 69k by the end of the year, deal? Make sure to let me know who your favorite dark type is in the comment section down below. Mine is definitely Sableye, but also I said Sableye in the shiny ghosts video, so just to add variety, I'm gonna go with Obstagoon for this one. It helps out tremendously that the goon has a god tier shiny, and it also helps out tremendously that you can just call Obstagoon the goon. I love that dude. Alright, with all of that out of the way, let's get into this. We're back in the Alola region, home to the only professor who hates shirts, and one of the most difficult Nuzlocke experiences you can get in the vanilla games. This is one of the rare times I'll be able to use a starter Pokemon, so we save in front of this patch of grass, and I go on a soft resetting spree. It takes a couple episodes of Stranger Things, but eventually, we find the white kitten. I name him JJ, and as always, my nicknames have a theme, and it's up to you to guess. This one is a show I think is perfect for the summertime, so if you know it, let me know in the comments down below. I get all the intro nonsense out of the way, and then find my actual starter of the run, this shiny rat. I catch her and name her Rose. Normally, I would just allow JJ to be used since he evolves into a dark type eventually, but since I'll have a full party of six Pokemon without him before the first totem battle, I just don't think that's necessary in this run. I then run around the professor's house and incredibly quickly find this shiny squid that I catch and name Limbre. The odds really blessed me with this one, except this dumb squid doesn't even have Contrary, which is a super rad ability. Instead, it has the markedly less cool suction cups. I then make my way to the trainer school, and even though there are three new dark types, I can get here, I'm gonna push off this encounter until later. You'll see why. I crush all the school children and then go to Merc Teacher Emily, only I forgot to give my Pokemon Oran berries to hold, and I forgot that Emily's Pokemon is a level 10. Still, with the power of friendship, I... Nope, that didn't work. The power of friendship is a lie. This is a wipe, and the second Nuzlocke in a row I have wiped to Emily. Fantastic. This is perfect for my work-life balance. Really good. Well, I guess I should explain the rules while soft resetting for a new kitten. This is a hardcore Nuzlocke, so in addition to standard Nuzlocke rules, I can't use any items in battle aside from held items, I can't overlevel past the next trial, and I have to play on set mode. Alola is already such a brutal region, and losing to Emily is a good reminder that I can't just YOLO things. So, after doing it all over again, I reset for a new white cat, who is a girl this time, so I name her Kiara. I find a new rat, and this one is once again gender swapped, so I name him Topper. And, to top it all off, my weird colored squid is also the opposite gender, so I name him Ward. And he still has the suction cups ability instead of contrary, which feels like a scam. All in all, this reset only set me back about 6 or 7 hours, so not terrible. With my new team, I make my way back to Emily, and I don't forget the berries, and I don't forget to properly train my team, and I bury her. Now we can make our way to Howley City, and in the grass, I hunt for a different colored pile of sludge, and eventually, I find her. Alolan Grimer is such a dope Pokemon, I am stoked to use it. I catch her and name her Sarah. After crushing some Team Skull Chumps, I have to fight Ilima, and normally this fight is tough because I've only ever had a max of two Pokemon here, but Topper has Hustle, a high risk ability that raises his damage output at the cost of some accuracy. Accuracy, and with the boosted damage makes quick work of the enemy young goose, and Ward is able to set up a reflect for Sarah who can easily tank the special hits from Smeargle and out damage it with bites. It's a pretty clean victory, and that's rare early on. With the island unlocked a little, I go on a hunting spree, and I catch a shiny Meowth I named Pope on Route 2, which now fully unlocks the trainer school for me. Since I have both a Grimer and a Meowth, I can only find Zora, and after a little bit of hunting, the fox shines blue, so I catch him and name him John B. Since Zora has main character energy. And finally, I end up in the cemetery where I find a shiny Murkrow
crow that I catch and name Sarah. Don't worry, I realized soon after that I had already used the name Sarah. I did this really late at night if you can't tell. Her name is really Rose. Now with the full party of six, we can head into the first boss battle of the run. And if you're interested in also doing some bossing but don't want to pick up a hardcore Nuzlocke right now, then let me suggest to you the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends. Let me thank them real quick. Alright, listen, if you're watching this video, I already know that you love strategy RPGs that involve team building and theory crafting to conquer any challenge. So Raid Shadow Legends, the sponsor of today's video, is the game for you. With over 600 champions, there are a ton of units to collect and team build with, and there's also an insane variety of bosses, all requiring different mechanics to beat them, so there's a ton of content for you to explore. Looking for a challenge? Why not take on Astronix, the Dark Fae? Her main mechanic is the doppelganger she summons at the start of combat, duplicating your entire team, meaning you have to build your team to beat your own team, which is insane. And honestly, those strategy team building elements are my favorite part of Raid because that's just a level of gameplay you don't get out of other mobile games. There's also just a ton happening in Raid this month. They're releasing five new insane looking champions that you'll want to get your hands on. They're completely overhauling the champion vault and they have a ton of other smaller updates coming out as well. And on top of all of that, Raid's running a huge series of summer splash events for the entire month where you can get your hands on some insane looking skins for everyone's favorite dwarf, Trunda. Oh, and there's one more thing. You got it. Ultimate Death Knight, coming August 2022. The Ultimate Death Knight is coming, so make sure you get in now if you want to be a part of it. This is honestly the best time to get started in Raid, and if you click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free Epic Champion Vergus, 200,000 silver, one free energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. These bonuses will only be available for the next 30 days and only to new players, so what are you waiting for? Click that link down below or scan this code and I will see you in game. Just as a reminder, for the island trials, my level cap is lifted as soon as I start the trial. You have to fight a bunch of random Pokemon and trainers during these trials sometimes, especially the early ones, so the level cap of 12 is only enforced until I walk in the cave. After that, it's free game. We clear the cavern and make our way to grab a random shiny stone where we are ambushed by an absolutely huge grumpy mongoose. I lead off with Sarah into him and on turn 1, I take a pretty hard tackle and land a poison gas to get some chip damage going, but surprise! this bitch is holding a Pecha Berry. I completely overlooked that in my documents and it's never come up before. Grumpy Cat calls in some young blood at the end of the turn and on the next one Sarah is leered and tackled to under half health triggering her Oran Berry. She then lands a poison gas on both rodents putting them on a timer. I pivot into Ward on the next turn taking an Odor Sleuth and a tackle then Ward actually outpaces and sets up a reflect before taking another pair of tackles causing him to eat his Oran Berry as well. We're in a great spot with reflect up in both enemy Pokemon points poison, so I stay in and get off a massive foul play on the gumshoes, dropping it to low red, as ward drops to 25% from another two tackles. Even in the yellow, we're pretty safe since we outspeed, so ward stays in and foul plays two more times, picking up the KO on both gumshoes and then young goose, winning us our first island challenge. Honestly, I think this is the cleanest first totem battle I have ever done, so the dark types are off to a great start. There really isn't anything notable left for us to do on the island, so we head straight to the grand trial versus Hala. He used is fighting type Pokemon which is terrifying but I have three Pokemon on my team in Sarah, Ward, and Rose who are all just neutral thanks to their typing so I'm feeling good about this fight. I challenge Hala and lead off with Ward into his Machop and on turn one I just set up a reflect as I take a soft revenge. A Psy Wave on the next turn does literally two damage as revenge chunks Ward to under half triggering his Oran Berry. I decide to go for a weird line on the next turn and use Swagger as the Machop wins what I guess was a speed tie and uses focus energy. The gamble pays off though as Ward wins two speed ties in a row and is able to KO the Machop using its own boosted attack stat with a couple of foul plays. That was a high risk high reward play, but I have Rose in the back if it went south and honestly I just love to gamble. Hollis sends out his Makuhita next, so I stay in and get Reflect back up after flinching from a fake out and then pivot out into Rose. A single wing attack drops the little sumo dumpling who only managed to land a sand attack. Hollis sends out his ace, a crab that looks like it has seen better days, and Rose stays in and goes for a wing attack but misses 
faces because of the sand attack drop, allowing the crab to use its Z-move, Flying Fists of Fury. Rose drops to exactly half health, meaning the reflect 100% mattered here, but she then manages to connect two wing attacks over the next two turns, murking the crab. Which is great, because my water just got to a boil and now we have some seafood to cook. We win our first grand trial, unlocking the rest of the island, which basically gives me an extra encounter later on, and a ton of leftovers from thieving munchlaxes. I can Mantine Surf to the next island now, and I just want to briefly mention this for all the people who might not know. Surfing opens up so many doors in these games, it gives you access to BP which is otherwise impossible to get, so now we have access to move tutors, great items, and eventually we'll be able to buy ability capsules to change our Pokemon's abilities. I just don't want people asking later how my abilities kept changing back and forth, so now you know. Now that we're on Akala Island, the challenge is heating up. You know they say everybody wants to be a master. Everybody wants to show their skill. Everybody wants to get there faster, make their way to the top of that hill. Brooklet Hill, specifically, where our next island challenge is. But first, I have to absolutely demolish Hao. And I'm gonna graze over this fight, but I think it really shows how valuable Sarah is, especially in the early game. She has learned Poison Fang by now, which has a 50% chance of inflicting toxic poison, and the ability Poison Touch, giving her contact moves an additional 30% chance to just normally poison. That means Poison Fang has an 80% chance to poison the enemy Pokemon in some capacity. And Sarah demonstrates that by poisoning each of Hao's Pokemon on the first attack. This is so good for wearing down big threats, but also I'm sorry for saying poison so much over the past seven seconds. Now, we have our first encounter with Gladion, whose heart will forever belong to Hot Topic in 2008, and this fight can sometimes be rough because his type null is just a monster of a Pokemon this early, but his first two Pokemon go down easily, and Sarah is able to, you guessed it, poison the type null, whittling it down so Rose can pick up the KO. So Gladion runs off angry while listening to the Devil Wears Prada, and we're free to be running up that hill. Brooklet Hill, that is. I've talked about this fight in every single hardcore Nuzlocke I've done of these games, but it's a nightmare. I broke down the math in the fairy video if you want to see it, but essentially, after all the boosts it gets, this spider's stupid bubble, which normally has a base power of 40, is hitting with a power of 180, which is insane. I challenge the demon spider and lead off with Sarah. We have to poison it early to have a shot here, so I lock into Poison Fang, and Sarah takes a strong bubble to just above half health, connects the Fang, and then gets the toxic damage off, which is is exactly what we needed. The big spider calls in its little spider friend and on the next turn a protect shields us from any damage while the poison chips away and leftovers gives us a smidge of health back. My entire team is so frail at this point in the game that a switch is just a sack and it looks like Sarah has a chance to live another attack so I go for the double protect and we get the coin flip baby stalling for another turn of poison damage. Not willing to risk a triple protect I switch into ward and long story short he just dies on switch in here. It's sad because Malamar late game could have been really cool, but I have specific uses in mind for all of my other Pokemon right now, so I need to keep them around. Finally, I can safely bring in Rose now that the Araquanid has taken enough damage, and she is able to outpace and finish off the Satan Roach with a critical hit wing attack. If you're wondering why I didn't just lead with Rose, just know that wing attack never one shot, even if it crit, and she always died to two bubbles. So I had to get the spider to around half health first to ensure the KO. We pick off the tiny bug with another critical hit wing attack, winning the shiny dark squad its second trial. Also, if you're wondering how Rose spiked two back-to-back -back critical hits, she has the ability Super Luck, raising her critical hit ratio by one stage, and she's holding the Scope Lens that you can get in Pinolia Ranch, raising it another stage. This means any move has a 50% chance to crit, and moves with an already boosted critical hit ratio have a 100% chance, which is a pretty sweet set, honestly. With our new level cap, both my Rat and Cat evolve into Raticate and Persian, respectively. Then, I hunt for and find a shiny Eevee after a couple of hours who I catch a named JJ. I run around like crazy to max out his friendship and level him up at night to evolve him into an Umbreon, who will just be a massive brick wall for our team, which is fantastic. And honestly, something I probably should have done before even fighting a Raquinid, because you can get an Eevee earlier than this. Then finally, I go back to Melee Melee Island and crush some Carbinks until they SOS call in a shiny Sableye, who I catch a name Rafe. I love Sableye so much, and I think it is super important for this run since it gives me an immunity to fighting type attacks, so I have a Pokemon to pivot around them with. Now, with all of that out of the way, we head to the Marowak trial. On paper, this trial seems easy because Marowak is a ghost type, making it weak to our team, but after looking at Calyx, I can promise you that is not the full story. Its partner, Salazzle, does a ton of damage to my team, and I only have one way to hit it for solid damage, and none of my Pokemon have hidden power ground, so we'll just have to brute force it out. I challenge the Fire Demon and lead off with Pope, who I've used an ability capsule on to give him the fur coat ability, making him pretty bulky by doubling his physical defense stat. On turn one, I 
go for a thief to steal this dude's bone, but he jukes me out with a detect and then calls in his seductive lizard friend. On the next turn, Pope uses thief again, stealing the thick club as he gets poisoned from the lizard and hit by a brick break. With the club gone, Marowak should be much more manageable now since we've essentially halved its attack stat. Shout out to this commenter who pointed out that I should probably be doing this. Your idea probably saved this run. Pope rests on the next turn to regain some health, but is immediately dropped back down to the yellow, so I bring in JJ who is mega bulky, and over the next few turns he takes an onslaught of attacks while lowering Marowak's attack further with baby doll eyes and getting in a little chip damage on the Salazzle with feign attack and finally confusing it with Confuse Ray. JJ drops to low red, so I have to switch out and this will be the deciding turn of the battle essentially. So I bring in Rose and the Salazzle hits itself in confusion which is huge, so she only takes a soft hit from the Marowak. On the next turn, the Lizard hits itself again and then drops to a wing attack. Now Rose is free to just focus down the resurrected mother, but she doesn't land any critical hits and eventually triggers Curse Body, so I switch her out into Sarah who is able to soak up flame wills from the weakened ghost and take it out with a few more thieves. Lots of thieving going on in this battle. The next trial is literally right around the corner in the game, so we head into Lush Jungle and get ambushed by this plant mantis thing. I lead off with Sarah and on the first turn I predict it to go for a solar blade so I protect, but it just goes for X scissor instead, so a wasted turn by me. It calls in Kecleon at the end of the turn and on the next turn I land a poison fang which toxics the plant and Sarah soaks up another X scissor and a screech which harshly lowers her defense. I start protecting to rack up toxic damage, but since my defense has been cut in half I have to pivot out into Pope on the next turn taking a soft dizzy punch. I feel good about the battle because the Lorantis is on the timer but I need to start focusing down the Kecleon. I hit it with a thief but I take a super hard solar blade and another soft dizzy punch to under half in return. I switch into Rose thinking she'll be able to tank those hits and maybe pick off the Lorantis, but instead she takes like 75% from a solar blade and just gets shot out of the sky with an ancient power. Why did Kecleon go for an ancient power here? No clue, but it did. So you know, she dies. Honestly, she was super frail and wasn't able to evolve until the very end of the game, so it sucks, but she wasn't contributing much to the team anyway since she just couldn't take hits. I send back out Sarah who is able to stall for a few turns chipping down the Kecleon while Lorantis gets stuck in a loop of just using synthesis each turn not to die, and when Sarah finally gets low, I send out JJ who is able to easily swallow hits from both Pokemon as Lorantis finally falls and then is able to easily pick off the Kecleon. So that's 4 trials down, and we've had 2 deaths so far, but we've caught less than half of our potential encounters so I'm not worried about it. We now have to go talk to the professor and his wife in the Dimensional Research Lab, but this isn't important. It might be key story elements, but it's not important. What is important is when we leave the lab, we look up and see the Alola region Skyusi. Okay, yeah, I hate myself for leaving that joke in. We now have to traverse through the Diglett Tunnel to get to the Grand Trial of the Island, and while in here, I hunt for a good chunk of time until I finally find a shiny Larvitar. I catch her and name her Peterkin. I won't be able to use her until the very end of the game, but she'll be super strong by then, so I think she's worth it. We make our way to Olivia, the thickest kahuna in the region, and it's time for another Grand Trial, baby. I lead off with Wraith into her Anorith, and by alternating Nightshades and Protects for Lefty's recovery, we are able to take out this little silverfish looking pest over several turns. She sends out Lilip next, so I switch into Sarah who takes absolutely nothing from a Giga Drain, and on the next turn is able to poison the plant with her ability putting it on a timer. Sarah has a great special defense stat and is now holding an Eviolite, so she can just keep attacking and eventually rests when she gets low to stall the Lilip out, forcing Olivia into her ace Lycanroc. This Pokemon has a super hard hitting Rocky MZ, so I bring out Pope for his physical bulk and he switches in on a bite that does essentially negative damage. Damage. I'm still worried about the Z move, so I protect, but this puppy just keeps biting. Over the next few turns, I alternate water pulses and protects to play it safe, and not once does this dog do anything but bite, which just does not make sense. But hey, it's an easy win. With the new level cap, John B can finally evolve into Zoroark, and honestly, I expected this Pokemon to get much more screen time, but he just hasn't been good for any of the challenges so far. Maybe that will change. Either way, that's grand trial number two down, and now we can move on to Ula Ula Island. Before we do, we have to make a pit stop at the Aether Paradise, which is clearly a very happy place that has nothing diabolical going on. No one is freezing Pokemon and trying to discover eternal youth or open different dimensions to worlds with literal demons in them. I can just tell. I mean, look at that Starmie, it's so happy. After leaving the happiest place in Alola, we arrive in Ula Ula and Hal won't even let me take two steps onto the island without fighting him. So we do. It's actually a pretty tough fight, and at the end of it, my team is properly 
barely worked over, but we make it through with no losses, almost exclusively thanks to JJ's bulk. Not having a water resist at this point in the game blows, because this game does not EV train Vaporeon like a wall. Instead, it maxes Vaporeon's special attack stats, so its water type attacks just crush. Now that we can walk around Ula Ula, I can tell this is a whole new world we live in. A whole new way to see. A whole new place with a brand new attitude. But you still have to catch them all to be the best that you can be. And by all, I mean only shiny dark types, so I immediately start hunting for a red panda, and after chaining panchamps together for several hours, eventually I get this fully evolved red pangoro, which is a neat thing that can happen in the Alola games. You can get like a level 9 Salamence on the first island or something, it's great. I catch the evil panda and name him Shoop. After that, I evolve Peterkin and Kiara into Pupitar and Torcat respectively, just so they don't fall super far behind. I'm still not letting myself use them because I still have hella options to work with. With our new panda friend, we can head straight to the electric trial, and this one is normally a nightmare. Not only can it be hard to piece together a winning strategy, but it is also normally mind-numbingly boring and stally. So let's see how this goes. The metal Pikachu clone charges us up, and I lead with the newly caught Shoop into him. I thought this was smart because he has Bulldoze to hit the rat with a quad super effective move, but I quickly learned that between Spiky Shield and Bounce, the only time I would even be able to connect an attack would be after taking Bounce damage, which I specifically brought Protect for. So we're not off to a great start. I send in Rafe and let him start soaking up hits while getting consistent damage on the Skarmory that Togodomaru called in by alternating between clicking Nightshade and Protect for Leftovers Recovery. My team doesn't really hit the bird well, so this seemed like the best way to chip it down. When Rafe drops to red health, I send out Pope, who is also able to soak up hits and takes the Skarm out with a Power Gem. I try Shoop again, but end up in the same predicament as earlier, so I send in JJ and just gutter this rat's attack stat by using Baby Doll Eyes over and over. With its attack stat in the trash, I send Pope in once more to steal its berry with Thief, and then use the obvious taunt to stop it from spiky shielding. Finally, it's back out into Shoop as the Metal Rat calls in a Fairy Rat, and he starts bulldozing the Togodomaru and Dedenne into the ground. This would be the end of the battle, but the Fairy Rat has Charm, which just decimates Shoop's attack stat, so I have to make one final switch into Topper, who gets to be the final hero of this story, taking out Dedenne with a quick attack and Togodomaru with a crunch. I told you, this battle is always a massive grind, and it sucks and is boring. I can't wait to do a mono fire or ground run just so I can destroy this specific trial. The new level cap is high enough for Kiara to evolve into Incineroar, so finally we can use the white cap we got at the very beginning of the game, and just in time since we now have to fight Guzma. He only has two Pokemon right now, but they're both really strong bug types, which can be a massive problem for my team. But thankfully, his Galissapod's only bug type attack is first impression, so we cheese it out with Protect, and his Masquerain is actually pretty threatening with Bug Buzz, but the combination of Kiara's Flame Charge and Rafe's Shadow Sneak are enough to take it out. Now I can hunt for the Pokemon that's my reason for picking Ultra Sun over Ultra Moon, Houndoom. I picked this game specifically because Houndoom was an Ultra Sun exclusive, but hindsight is 20-20, and if I could go back, I think I would pick Ultra Moon so I could have access to Mandibuzz instead, because I need more bulky Pokemon and ground resists, not more glass cannons. Either way, I catch him and name him Barry. The Mimikyu trial is next, and this one's always terrifying, but it's especially terrifying when I'm using only dark types. Mimikyu is the first totem Pokemon to get an Omni Boost, and this little cloth goblin has play rough, meaning if I'm not careful, he can just roll my entire team. I lead off with Pope into the Pikachu wannabe, and on turn one, a crit play rough drops Pope to just 19 HP, but he gets off a thief, stealing the Mimikyu's Lumberry and breaking its disguise, which is perfect. Mimikyu calls in Binette at the end of the turn, so I bring out Kiara, taking a play rough for about a third of her health, and then nullifying a Will-O-Wisp. I slow U-turn on the next turn so I can bring in JJ without him taking an initial hit, and then it's back to the baby doll eye strats, baby. I stay in until the Mimikyu's attack stat is dumpstered, soaking up attacks along the way, and incidentally burning the Binette thanks to Synchronize. When JJ can no longer stay in safely, I bring in Sarah, and it's unfortunate timing since she switches in on a curse, but I have to stay in and go for the Poison Fang anyway. I get it off, taking minimal damage from Play Rough, and Sarah manages to snag a poison, which is perfect. I have her stay in one more turn, risking the crit to rest up to full, and we dodge the RNG this time, getting Sarah back in the green. From this point, I can just pivot around, first to Rafe, then to Barry, and then finally back out to Sarah again, and the Mimikyu succumbs to its own poison, and Binette falls to its self-inflicted burn. That was an insane fight, and once again an example of how great an 80% chance to poison is. As insane as that fight was though, it's not even close to the hardest we'll have this run, so buckle up. With the 6 island trial done, we can go kinda nuts here. I hunt for and catch a shiny Absol, shiny Crocorock, shiny Scraggy, and a shiny Bisharp. I name them Cleo, Big John, Kels, and Denmark respectively. Then I evolve
evolve Big John into Crocodile, Sarah into Alolan Muck, and finally Kels into Scrafty. Around two days of work compressed down neatly to 30 seconds for your viewing pleasure. Now with some shakeups to the team, I have to infiltrate the Team Skull lair to save a rat and fight Guzma or something, but nothing interesting happens here other than a smoking Guzma, so this is a compilation of me body bagging his team. And now we're moving on. The third grand trial is versus Nanu, and he kind of springs it on us out of nowhere, but he also uses dark types, so this is an honor battle. There can be only one dark type trainer in this region, and it's me. So we challenge him, and let me cut the suspense here a little. We may both use dark types, but I have two dark fighting type Pokemon on my team. So after Shoop crunches his ghost down, my fighting types make pretty quick work of the rest of his team. Also, my dark types are shiny, so he never really stood a chance because that just means their superior. Now it's time for the part of the story where we go back to the Aether Paradise and find out that it's not actually all that happy, and they are in fact freezing Pokemon, trying to find the secret for eternal youth, and opening portals to dimensions with actual demons in them. Huh, who could have guessed that? There are a few tough gauntlets you have to fight through here leading up to your final fight with Guzma, and I've been really scared of him every fight, but now Pope knows Nasty Plot, so a protect on the first turn versus his Galissapod to nullify his first impression into setting up Nasty Plots means my early game cat can just swat his entire team down with power gems, which is pretty dope. Next up is the Lusamine fight, and honestly, I just wasn't prepared for this fight like I thought I was. She normally just makes the most ridiculous plays, but I let Sarah get worn down early, meaning I don't even have a check to her Milotic when it comes out, and remember, I have no water resists. So even though I've piled her other four Pokemon into a mass grave, I end up in a spot where Big John is in at plus one attack in front of a full health Milotic, and he just can't one-shot it ever. My entire team is thrashed except for Kiara and Pope, so after legitimately five minutes of running calcs, I switch into Pope and Lusamine just goes for an icy win, which Big John would have 100% lived. I hate it here. Pope gets fully paralyzed on the next turn and falls to a hyper pump. Rest in peace, bud. You earned it. I don't even have a game plan at this point, and my lot it can just sweep my team from here, so I pray for some luck and send out Denmark. Instead of just taking the kill with a hydro pump, Lusamine goes for a flail on the next turn, and it does actual three damage. This lets Denmark land a thunder wave, and from here, I just start clicking iron head like the degenerate Jirachi player I am, but the Milotic breaks through on the first turn, but still doesn't go for the kill, she goes for another Icy Wind, I'm losing my mind. From this point on, we get one full paralysis and two flinches with Iron Head, putting the fish in range of an assurance and saving our run. By all metrics, that should have been a wipe, but wow, I am so glad Lusamine is programmed with dog water AI. I don't even want to step foot in this place again, that was so stressful and anxiety inducing, off to Pony Island. On the final island, we can once again go nuts, but this time, all three Pokemon will be the exact same type. I start off by SOS chaining a Carvana in Pony Breaker Coast, and when I tell you I almost fell out of my chair when I realized the shiny also had its hidden ability and speed boost, I mean it. I catch him and name him Hayward. What a dope find. Then I use the island scan feature in Pony Wilds, and after resetting the hunt four times, I finally run into a shiny Greninja. I catch her and name her Wheezy. Finally, in Vast Pony Canyon, I start another fishing SOS. SOS chain until I find a shiny core fish, but this one unfortunately did not have its hidden ability. I catch him and name him R Merchant, short for Royal Merchant. I evolve Hayward into Sharpedo, and now that I've added 300% more water types to my available dark type Pokemon, it's time for the penultimate island trial of the game. This and the next one are both so frustratingly difficult, it's hard to decide which is worse. I've pieced together the best strategy I can, so let's hope it works. I challenge the Samurai Dragon and lead off with Big John into him. I've used an ability capsule, so he has Intimidate now, and to capitalize on this, I start the battle by pivoting back and forth between Big John and Wraith. These two synergize perfectly here because Big John causes the AI to want to use a fighting type attack, but Wraith is immune and forces the AI to go for other attacks, letting me get Big John back in for as little damage as possible. After two cycles of this, the Noivern that Koma O called in hits Big John with a Dragon Pulse, dropping him below half health. So I pivot once more into Wraith and get a Will-O-Wisp off on the Koma O as it goes for a soft Dragon Claw on the Bat Dragon just misses its screech. Now, if I went turn by turn for the entire battle, this section would take forever because the fight itself was over 10 minutes. So let me summarize from here. With Koma O essentially shut down because of the attack drops and the burn, I pivot around until I end up with Sarah, who takes out the Noivern with a couple of gunk shots. And as soon as the Koma O calls in Scissor, I realized that was a mistake. I should have just taken out the Samurai Dragon first, but it's 
too late to go back now. I tank for a long time on what to do, but inevitably I end up in with JJ once again to lower the scissors attack with baby doll eyes as much as I can. I realize I'm in a spot where as long as JJ can dodge crits, he can keep healing with moonlights to keep lowering its attack stat, but he doesn't have any attacking moves, so this is not a good plan for the long term. Eventually, I pivot into Hayward, but that's a flop, since even with lowered stats, he still drops to only 4 HP from the incoming attacks. So, after a ton of thinking, I land on going into Rafe, since his whole job was just to act as a pivot for this fight, it's okay if he goes down. I've saved him the entire time for this fight, and we're already here. But to my surprise, he holds and is able to stall until the Koma O drops from its burn, and then Will-O-Wisps the scissor to fully shut it down, and finally take it out with a Nightshade into Shadow Sneak combo. Like I said, I've saved Rafe this entire run, planning from the moment I caught him to use him in this fight as my only answer to drain punches, and he not only did that, but he actually clutched the entire fight in the end. What a legend. With Koma O beaten, we have to go watch as Lusamine returns from the multiverse and brings her new demon friend with her, and now we have to fight this thing. The first time we fight Necrozma Duskmane, its AI is painfully dumb and it keeps going for psychic type attacks into my dark type Pokemon, letting me easily take it out. But then we have to chase it down through time and space to face its ultimate form, Ultra Necrozma. This fight is unlike any other in the franchise, it's brutal. Necrozma gets a double Omni Boost at the start of the battle, and it's like 10 levels over our level cap, so there is only one Pokemon who I can rely on to fell this monster, Topper. No seriously, watch. We challenge Ultra Necrozma on Dragon Mode, and on turn one, we go for an Endeavor. Thanks to our Focus Sash, we live the incoming Dragon Pulse at 1 HP, then drop this giant lizard to 1 HP as well. On the next turn, we go for a Quick Attack and just take it out. This strategy is foolproof and works every time. And honestly, I think it's dope that my answer to this behemoth of a Pokemon was our Route 1 Rodent. I've played cautiously with him this entire game just to make sure I had him for this specific fight, and if that bugs you, I'm sorry, but I'll probably still be able to sleep at night. This fight is dumb without gimmicks. Now that we've saved the world, I can finish out my island trial and beat the game. You know, the really important stuff. Our final island trial is upon us, so after crushing Mina and collecting some flower petals, we have to fight her totem Rabombi. This Pokemon Pokemon also gets a double Omni Boost at the start of the battle, but I'm much less afraid of it. I challenge it, leading with Denmark, and since the AI doesn't see a super effective attack with Pollen Puff or Dazzling Gleam, the B should always use Quiver Dance. So I lock into Stone Edge, and thanks to the scope lens he's holding, he snags a 50% critical hit chance and just unalives the B on the first turn. It doesn't even get to call in an SOS Pokemon. Had that not panned out in my favor, I could have always switched to Sarah and Toxic stalled the B out, but I basically I basically always go for the Stone Edge Gambit if I have it available because I think it's funny and it makes for a quick battle. Like I always say, I'd rather be lucky than good. Now I have my final Grand Trial versus Hapu, but let's just speed run it. I pick up a quick KO on her Golurk by leading Shoop into it and just popping it with a crunch. I then set up a scenario where I burn her Mudsdale Z move by parting shotting into Wraith, who's holding an air balloon to be completely immune to ground type attacks. I then burn the horse with Will-O-Wisp to lower its attack further and switch into Cleo, who I've wanted to use at least once in this run. Run. Like Rose before her, she also has super luck, so after I set up a few sword stances, every single one of my night slashes will be a 100% guaranteed crit while she's holding the scope lens, so she slashes through Mudsdale and Gastrodon, and finishes by landing a crit sucker punch on Flygon for the win. And that's it, every island and grand trial beaten by shiny dark type Pokemon. It's time for the Pokemon League. First, I finally evolved Peterkin, who has been waiting patiently in the PC for this moment when the level cap is high enough for her to finally become a Tyranitar. Then, while heading into Mount Lanaquila, Gladian challenges me to one final battle, but Peter can easily snipes his Crobat out of the sky, Rafe tricks the AI into letting Barry in for free to melt his Lucario, his Zoroark falls to attacks from Denmark and sand damage, and finally Rafe burns his Silvali, crippling its attack and takes it out with some Nightshades. Gladian then once again runs off flustered listening to some 2010s post-hardcore, and honestly, that's a vibe. Take me back to 2010, throw on some Attack Attack, and let me hardcore dance without feeling Feeling like my knee is going to fall off of my body. I'm all about that life. With Gladian down, I have one final encounter to hunt for in Sneasel, so I fire up an SOS chain and eventually we find this pink little goober. I catch him and name him John B. Also. It's a shame that Zoroark did nothing for this entire run, so I want to put some respect on his name and give it to an actually good Pokemon. I evolve John B. into Weavile and then I get to planning for the Elite Four. I no joke spent three hours looking at all of the matchups and running counts and I think the sheer number of Pokemon I had available for this made it that much harder. Seriously, let's pause on 
on this screen and just talk about it for a second. In the box, I have Zoroark and Houndoom as fast special attackers who cannot take a hit at all. Absol is a crit machine who can also not take a hit. Sharpedo, Crawdon, and Greninja are all water dark types. Incineroar and Scrafty are bulky physical attackers. Alolan Raticate is a retired Pokemon. He's perfect and is never coming out of the PC. And finally, Umbreon and Alolan Muck is bulky support style Pokemon. In my party, I have Rafe, John B, Peterkin, Denmark, Shoop, and Big John. I thought this was my best possible team, but really, after studying the matchups and running calcs, I think Peterkin just doesn't do enough here, which is insane because Tyranitar is a god tier Pokemon, but it compounds my ground weakness and makes my already bad fighting weakness that much worse. So I add Wheezy back to the team, and this spot could probably also be Sarah, but once again, she just does not help out with our ground weakness. So I lock in this team, tweak movesets, use EV reducing berries to fine tune my spreads because it's actually that serious, and I gather any last items or TMs I need and enter the Elite Four. I decide to start off with the hardest member for my team, Acerola. Then I remember that Sarcasm doesn't always play well in videos, and John B and Wheezy murk her entire team. There are no tense moments in this fight. Next. I challenge Olivia second, and I lead off with Denmark, who outspeeds her entire team somehow, and on turn one, he just crushes her Armaldo. She sends out her Lycanroc next, and this thing has counter, so I start setting up iron defenses to try and bait it into doing literally anything else, which it never does. Then on the turn, I go to start clicking Sword Stance. I actually misclick and hit Iron Head, but we get the flinch. I don't think I've ever f***ed up that bad and been rewarded for it. Had Lycanroc not flinched here, Denmark would just be dead. We take out the puppy on the next turn, bringing out her Probo Pass, and I Iron Head it for some solid damage, but it paralyzes Denmark, so I pivot into Shoop to pick up the KO, and from here, it's just pivoting around between Denmark, Shoop, and Big John to pick up the rest of the KO since they all have type advantages. Once again, aside from my misclick, no real tense moments in this fight. With the easier two of the Elite Four down, I decide to take on Kahili next, so I lead off with John B into her Braviary and just freeze the bird out of the sky with a single ice punch on turn one. We run it back on the next turn by also dropping her Halucha, so she sends out her Mandibuzz, which I cannot one-shot. And of course, after it lives an ice punch, it confuses me with a flatter. And of course, John B hits himself on the next turn, so it's time to switch strategies up a bit. I send out Rafe to burn the buzzard, then go into Denmark taking a soft brave bird. Two iron heads pick the buzzard off, but it does manage to flatter Denmark before going down. She sends out her ace to cannon next, and it goes for supersonic sky strike, but Denmark resists and has a fat defense stat, so he lives comfortably, and then his big brain hits through confusion and chunks the bird down to below half with an iron head. Kahili actually does a cool AI thing here and switches into her Oricorio since it resists iron head, but this gives me an opening to go out into Wheezy who will always live a revelation dance and picks off the Firebird and Toucan over the next two turns with Choice Specs boosted Scalds. That's three down, one to go. Mulane is the member I was most worried about in the Elite Four and the one that had the absolute worst calcs, and honestly, I think a lot of this battle will be decided on how he switches around. I lead off with Big John into his Clef Key and on turn one, I just go for a Break Break predicting it to set up Reflect, and it does. So I shatter it, which should signal to the AI to do anything else on the next turn. So I click Earthquake, and the keys just set up a layer of spikes, then die. Big John gets a Moxie boost, and Mulane sends out Metagross. According to my calcs, I have around a 66% chance to kill here, so I take that shot in Earthquake, and we hit the roll, knocking out the second biggest problem to my team. Bisharp is next, but we just immediately send it back to its ball with an Earthquake, forcing out a Lolan Doug trio, and honestly, the only way the order could have been more perfect is if Metagross had come out third. I protect on the first first turn trying to bait out its Z-Crystal, but it just attacks normally, so on the next turn we trade Earthquakes, and Big John lives at half health and mercs the trio of Owen Wilsons. Mulane then sends out his final Pokemon Magnezone, and honestly had this come out any earlier, it would have made my life so much worse, because it's always guaranteed an attack with Sturdy, and that damage combined with Doug Trio's Earthquake could actually KO Big John, but he saved it for last, which is great for me and terrible for him. I protect on turn 1 to Scout, then switch into Wheezy on a resist resisted flash cannon and immediately have her U-turn out on a discharge, breaking the magnet sturdy and letting Big John permanently demagnetize them on the next turn with a final earthquake. And that's all the elite four members beaten, and I could not be more excited at how smooth that last battle went. I was expecting so much worse here. Now it's time for the champion battle versus Hal, and this fight looks incredibly intense. I just do not have any good answers to Vaporeon or Tauros, so I think those will 100% be my pressure points. I heal up my team, move items around, and chat.
challenge him. I lead off with John B into his Alolan Raichu, and on turn one, we just murk his rat with a critical hit Night Slash, bringing in this fucked up looking crab. I switch into Ray for the immunity to its power up punch, and then double switch into Denmark on an Ice Hammer, which actually does a solid amount of damage. But Denmark shatters the Yeti on the next turn with a single Iron Head. Tauros is out next, and Intimidate does trigger Defiant, but I can't really capitalize on it since it would mean staying in and taking a hard earthquake. So I switch into Shoop on the EQ, then double into Wraith on the double edge, getting him in for free and letting me burn the bull with a will o wisp Then it's back out into Shoop who can use a slow parting shot to get Wheezy in for free, allowing her to snipe the rest of the bull's health with the specs boosted Scald. Decidueye comes out next, so I switch into Denmark, and Hal makes the ultra pro play of double switching into Vaporeon here, which is absolutely terrible for me. And honestly, I needed to push off this thing coming in for as long as possible. I switch back into Wheezy, who takes way too much from a Hydro Pump, and now I'm in a really rough spot. This is my only water resist, and it can't even take another attack, so it's time to start picking sacks. I U-turn into Shoop, who goes down to a critical hit Hydro Pump, and then I send out Wraith. Wraith protects to stall for a turn, and then I go into the tank for a long time before realizing Big John doesn't do anything for me anymore. So I switch into him, and he immediately drowns, forcing me back out into Wraith. I protect to stall again, and then I can't remember if the Vaporeon has used all five Hydro Pumps or not, so I pivot into Wheezy again, but Hal also withdraws his Vaporeon, letting me know he has nothing but Quick Attack left, which is great. Not so great as he brings in Decidueye, and I'm once again in a terrible spot. I come to terms with the fact that I can win this fight without Wheezy, so I lock into Ice Beam, which hits incredibly hard but doesn't kill, letting the Ghost Owl take out my Frog with a Bloom Doom. I send back out Wraith, and a Will-O-Wisp into a Shadow Sneak is enough to take out the Owl, bringing out Hal's Noivern. I Shadow Sneak one final time for a little bit of chip damage, and watch as Wraith goes down to a Dragon Pulse. Seeing the finish line, I send out John B, who outpaces and absolutely murks the Noivern with an Ice Punch, and then, it's just a matter of landing a few critical hit Night Slashes to body bag the Vaporeon, while all it can do is charm me and use Quick Attacks. I get the two crit slashes in a row after Hal tried to heal up his Water Fox, and with that, we've won the battle and the run. Looking back, I'm not sure what I could have done here to minimize losses in this champion battle. Almost certainly I needed Protect on Weavile because that would have let me burn through Hydro Pump PP insanely fast since he has pressure, and maybe Wheezy should have been Sarah so I had a Mon with a good special defense stat, but it's hard to know. Like I said, I think all of the options I had available made formulating the perfect team for the Elite Four hard, but we got through and I'm proud of that. If you think you could have come up with something better, let me know what you would have gone with in the comment section down below, and as always, let me know what team member you thought was MVP of the run. This region is really not kind to dark types, with almost every major challenge having something that can just end your run, so I'm really proud of this. It was also just a ton of fun, and I really do love the challenge of the Alola region. I have a poll running right now on my channel for what type I should do a shiny monologue with next, so go over there and let me know. Also, remember to leave a like if you enjoyed this video, and consider subscribing to help me hit 69k by the end of the year. That's all I have for you today, so with that being said, I am kind of done here and I have to leave. Bye.